Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks very much for joining us uh, for what is the second session today. We've already had one looking at um, ESG, social impact, and um, particularly looking as well at the senior living um, and healthcare side. So here we're looking at a little bit more about um, ESG sustainability, particularly within the context of, of logistics. So um, fascinating discussion. For those who don't know me, my name is Richard Betts. Um, I'm the publisher at Real Asset Media, and we publish Real Asset Insight, which looks at, um, I guess, across the, across the main geographies and the main sectors, um, and looking mainly at the sort of analysis, research, trends, thought leadership, um, so the kind of things that get you ahead of where the deals are, um, those kinds of things. And we also publish Real Asset Ins Impact, which focuses on sustainability, um, on social impact and purpose-driven investment. And in terms of that, we take a position, which is that we want to drive that forward. So it's to share initiatives that are driving that forward. And this panel will also be written up by Nicole, who is there, who's editor of Impact, and that will be in the next issue. So you'll be able to read all of the I'm kind of things to make from that. Um, let's, yeah. let's start with a quick introduction because we've got a, a, a fantastic yeah. panel here. Yeah. Um, let's, let's start from this end, uh, actually, for a change. Bodhi, let's, let's start with you. Sure, thank you, uh, Richard. I'm Bodhi Hedgecock. I'm a partner at Clarion Partners based in New York. I help manage our uh, roughly 18 million square meter logistics portfolio in the US. Clarion also acquired a business here in Europe in 2019, Clarion Partners Europe, it's branded today. That's about one and a half, two million square meters of logistics properties across Europe. And uh, in addition to my portfolio management responsibilities, I help lead ESG efforts in our industrial uh, business in the US. Great, and it's going to be really interesting to get that perspective yeah. from the US as well. Um, great, thanks very much. Bert. My name is Bert Hesselink. I'm Group Client Relationship Director at CTP. A CTP were the largest listed developer, owner, and operator of logistics and industrial parks in Europe, active in 10 countries from the North Sea to the Black Sea, Netherlands, Germany, Austria, and all of Central and Eastern Europe. 11 million square meters, leads to more than 1,000 clients, land bank of 20 million square meters. Our plan is to double in size before the end of uh, the decade. Great, thank you. Anna. Hello, Anna Tatari from B Design co-founder and head of uh, ESG and sustainability. B Design is a company working globally with ESG sustainability consultants, architects and engineers. Our key uh, pillars are really designing new sustainable developments, decarbonizing existing assets and assisting our clients with uh, crafting their ESG strategies at corporate level. Thank you. Great, Yost. Joost, founder, Joost Lenens, the founder of Verisol. Um, we, uh, we are a solution provider, a one-stop shop to decarbonize uh, large asset portfolios. Great, and, uh, and Ingo, and may I say, so that you don't have to say it yourself, congratulations on winning the award at last night's Logics Awards. So I can... Yes. <laughs> a photo opportunity for anybody there. Yes. Yeah. There couldn't be a better timing. Huh? Yesterday night we get the ESG uh, prize here. No? With 26 developers worldwide has introduced their developments and we made it no? with our um, um, Duisburg North development. Um, absolutely ESG top profile. And thank you very much, uh, Richard, that I have the opportunity to present this to you guys. Great, thank you. And uh, of course, it's, it's deliberately a small intimate space, which means if you've got questions, if you've got things that you want to contribute, please do, and we'll try to make sure we, we deal with those. Um, and also, welcome to everybody who's, who's joining us here on the On Demand um, as, as part of our program of, uh, of events live from Expo Real. Um, Bodhi, let, let's start with you. Um, <laughs> In terms of, because I want to pick up on, I guess, the perspectives around this topic from the US and also then just see the perspectives from Europe and obviously, um, but you're as well seeing it from different aspects of Europe as well. So it'd be interesting to get, uh, I guess, how you see this topic from a US perspective, Bodhi. So uh, if we're defining this topic as how we think about ESG and logistics industry <laughs> generally, is that right? So I would say that, um, Historically, the logistics sector was slower to adopt many ESG priorities compared to office, residential, retail. Um, and I think that was for two reasons. One, uh, for many of our tenants, it was not a top priority. 
And for um, and because of the lease structure, which is a triple net structure in the U.S., where the tenants are really responsible for the operation of the building, the use of, of resources, there was limited ability to impact the the performance of the buildings. We just weren't in control. Both of those things are changing. Um, we've seen a lot of additional pressure from our <laughs> investor community to up our game to improve our ESG <coughs> performance. Um, that's translated into action. But I think more importantly is we're really starting to see our tenants come to us directly and say, we want to run our operations greener. We want to take advantage of our buildings to be part of our solution to our net zero goals. And so it's becoming uh, a more robust conversation where there's more cooperation from the tenant and the landlord side. So uh, we've made a lot of progress, long way to go. Um, that's, that's my general take. Great, and uh, Bert, it'd be interesting just to pick up from your perspectives how you're seeing that as well ac across the different areas where you're working. Yeah, so uh, when we talk about ESG, um, for us, I typically divide it into two areas. We have conversations with financiers, banks, um, investors, um, where we talk about ESG. Um, and that's very important for us, and we need to do a lot of reporting. Um, and the better we score, the better financing we get cheaper financing. That's one area. Where I'm uh, focused on is working with our clients. That's the other area. So the tenants, the users. And there we see progress um, where more and more clients are uh, interested and they are demanding that they are renting warehouses that maybe are not, I think here we should not talk too much about ESG because that's not such a topic. What is a topic is carbon neutrality. So um, yeah, the focus is very much there on CO2 neutral operations. Um, so that's very much the E in ESG. And there's good progress there. So uh, research shows that uh, nowadays 90% of large corporations have some form of ESG agenda and a big part of it is a goal towards achieving carbon neutrality. And, um, you know, be, uh, and I'm going to pick up with you Anna and Joost in a minute on this. Um, you know, it would be interesting just to pick up with you in terms of your occupiers, your tenants, um, are you seeing significantly more demand in, in terms of uh, ESG compliant buildings especially? And what are they thinking? What are they moving towards in terms of their focus on ESG? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, it's a must have uh, in these days uh, to win uh, deals. Um, we have one core competence, no? that is uh, getting land under control no? with option agreements, buying um, the land directly, you need to convince the municipality, for example, that you are the right partner. On the other hand, you need to convince your occupiers that you have uh, carbon-free neutral buildings that you can develop for them. No? If you don't have that, and we are targeting only the top customers, no? like uh, Renault, like Amazon, like Adidas, no? they have all in the strategy a, a, a carbon-free um, footprint. So you need to deliver this kind of buildings. Otherwise, you're out of the business with them. That's a matter of fact. <laughs> and, and Anna, it would be interesting. And feel free, anybody, to come in. I'll yep. set a rule that you can just come in whenever you <laughs> feel it, it's, it's needed. Um, Anna, it would be interesting just to pick up with you in, in terms of what the developers are looking at at the moment when you're getting you know, consultancy projects coming through. Um, what are they asking for and, and what are you advising them to put into the buildings that are obviously going to be the buildings of the future um, because they're being developed? So developers will come with probably a brief that starts as a gold, so gold ESG achievement, so we'll start really high. Um, we then start exploring the silver and the bronze option, depending on the cost. But ESG and sustainability is number one priority. Um, it does start from planning, so planning is quite important and we need to justify what we're doing from a sustainability but also social point of view. Social value is quite important for planning, um, but uh, when investors and funders are involved, their requirements are even more um, challenging, um, especially in, uh, in Europe with EU taxonomy, the CREM alignment, that, align, that, that's all very much a, a, a you know, basic requirement. Um, in the UK, I find there is a lot of, um, let's say, the profile and the, the developers need to make sure that they are they're raising their profile and make sure that they attract the right tenants. And tenants have already 
um, committed to some net zero targets that they need to achieve and to, to do that they need to make sure they are in the right building so that's the kind of um, um, you know tree of how priorities work um, in the US interestingly we're about to complete a, a logistics building which is uh, half a million square feet uh, sustainability was not part of the discussions. Um, I'm sure it will probably come later, <laughs> but <laughs> so far, we're, we're, I think we're finishing the building in uh, two months. Uh, yeah. It's not been mentioned. So I, that's, I, that's, <laughs> that's I, our maybe, experience. Maybe I will jump in because I would say, uh, you know, a difference between the US and Europe, it seems to me, is that our tenants are not demanding net zero buildings. In fact, if they want one, they couldn't find one probably today. Yeah. So it, we are behind from that standpoint and same tenants. Amazon, you know, Federal Express, DHL, all these. The, the expectation is they would like to have a green building. They will prefer a green building, but it hasn't come to this point in the U.S., in my experience, that it's a must-have. Um, with, with a few exceptions, generally European com companies who are taking their expectations from Europe and bringing them to the U.S., that'll push the market forward, right? I think that's the trajectory for sure. But it would be, I think, a stretch to say that our tenants are demanding it today. Absolutely. We have a customer-centric business. Yeah. And we look what uh, the customers need. No? Mm. And they look at our buildings. If we don't have this env env environmental stuff, mm. they have CapEx. They own right. CapEx. They spend in our buildings. Yeah. And the same, I think, Bert, is uh, from the financing point of view or from the investor's point of view. If you don't have a green building, you get a discount on the pricing. No? Love it or hate it, you need to do it. No? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's interesting that. Do, do you think? Um, do you think that there's going to be a sort of more rapid catch up in the in the states, Bodhi? Do you think? I mean, obviously we sit in Europe and obviously pat ourselves on the back and say, "Aren't we fantastic in compared to the <laughs> states?" But is that fair? And I suppose what what's happening there? Well, I, I think the trend, like I said, is certainly positive and and a fairly steep slope. You know, just as an example. We never used to do any of our developments with any kind of green certification. There was a cost associated with it. We couldn't necessarily justify an additional rent that you would get for having that certification. Um, about two years ago, we enrolled in through the LEED program, which is more common in the US, something called LEED Volume, which now allows us to do certification on every one of our developments, uh, probably 100 million square feet that's been certified over the last two years. So we've taken that step to do certification on our buildings found honestly that many of our buildings already met many of the green criteria. Industrial buildings tend to be relatively green if you leave out the fact that they're made of concrete and steel, right, um, from an embodied carbon standpoint, but they're, they're quite efficient buildings. So getting the certification wasn't difficult. The volume program allowed us to do it at a lower cost and a little more streamlined process. And now we're finding that we think we have a competitive advantage because we have more of them than our competitors do. Our competitors are piling into that space also. And everyone will keep upping up the game to be competitive. So I think it's coming, but it's just not, it, it, it's not fully there yet. But see, I think uh, one of the main differences that um, you have in US um, uh, unlimited access to energy, for example, mm -hmm. that is in Europe uh, for some reasons not the case. No? And then we ne need to look at heating pumps, solar panels, no? so that we have um, independent energy for occupiers. And it's a marketing tool as well yep. for the municipality, no? because our roofs are serving households. No? In Düsseldorf, for example, at that building, many thanks for just as we have this one here in, in place, we are serving 11,000 households in Düsseldorf, no? yeah. so you have common sense yeah. with the municipality, with the building permit authority, that you get the building permit to build that. No? Yep. Because we have constrained markets in mm -hmm. land banks. No? It's, we had this uh, uh, pre, pre co uh, prep call, no? Midwest in US, unlimited access to land. In Europe, in the Netherlands, Benelux, for example here, uh, yours, no? it's yeah. quite not that easy to get land, right? Yeah, what you see in the market, what you see in the market is that the old model of roof to please is still here. We don't see that many tenants are willing to pay more for green electricity. So the problem is, is that you have to find the right solution to do so. And how simpler, how better it is. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple, like an elevator. I always say of a toilet. You, you have to do a toilet in the building, otherwise is it not rentable. 
Nou, the same as you have to put decarbonization measurements on your building and you should be the owner. So rooftop lease model, so you rent out your roof to a third party, will never work mm. on the end. And, and tenants should use it. And so, yeah. I mean, I've had or a lot of discussions, Joost, yeah. relatively recently, including at the EPRA conference, looking at some of these challenges, particularly around taxation and ownership issues and energy generally, that actually they want to do far more in terms of solar on the roof because there's an understanding that there's going to be increased electrification. So there's actually going to be demand yeah. for more energy. Mm -hmm. Planning is getting tighter. And so actually people don't want a large logistics area that is going to be hungry to take things off the grid. Mm -hmm. But equally, they don't necessarily want it going to the grid either. Um, in, some, in some cases, I, I can see that that's different in Dusseldorf. Um, yes, so what's the solution? Because obviously you mentioned at the start that you are a solution provider, but all in one. Yeah. So what is that solution? Does that get around those sorts of tax things, particularly if you're a REIT status, for example, which came through very clear at EPRA. And for those who don't know, that's, that's, the, that's the sort of association that looks after the listed community, real estate community in Europe. It's, it's all depending on consolidation, how you consolidate the PV system and where you want to have it. And you can, there are so many ways to solve this, uh, community participation, even you can put in, uh, all, all kinds of ways are possible. Everything starts with a real good design and then a common sense to all the parties involved that you want to create this. And that's the starting point. And are we talking here about the aim is to generate, self-generate, if you like, from yeah. your own, so okay. you, you have invested in the PV, on the roof, so it is generating its own electricity. The building owner should always invest in a PV system. That's the correct order how it should be. Because the building owner is always the beneficial one on the end, the building. Yeah, the building should invest, and that is the starting point from all. Uh. But um, sometimes the perspective is different no, from uh, the development perspective. Look at this deal here, for example. You see the households yeah. uh, yeah. um, behind that. No? You, don't, you have a site in the middle of Düsseldorf. No, no building permit is given. No? Mm -hmm. So you need to have some value add to the municipality that, they, that give you the building permit. No? Yeah. And our uh, core business is the building and not solar panels. Mm -hmm. no? and I understand solar panels that. can be with the municipality, no? with the Stadtwerke, with the power station, with the power yeah. company. So, so, so you get everything very smooth. No? So you get the building permit not in two or three years, you get it in two or three months. Mm -hmm. no? And but uh, as we have an IRR driven uh, 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 business, you know, as a private mm -hmm. equity in investor, time is money. Yeah. In this case, is the outcome is you're also using it to get quicker a building permit. Now, so, okay, we keep that in our solution in mind. Okay, this is your goal of this, how we can achieve it with more solar panels. So then you're going to, to cut it legally in the solutions. One part is for the building to make it net zero. And in the other one part, yeah, where you're not going to invest yourself as a building owner because you are in building and you want to have rent and not income of electricity, you're going to do local participation. Right. And that's... Yes. But you use your space, like for different tenants, now you have tools <laughs> on. Yes. But, you, but you still have control. It, it would be win -win. interesting. It would be interesting just to pick up on um, the energy resilience part because that, that may be less of a topic, Bodhi, in, in, in the US, or is it? And I'd be interested to get your view on that, Bert, as well. Yeah, no, actually, I think it's becoming more of an issue. So I think we are not as constrained as, as Europe is in general. But, you know, California is dealing with energy shortages. Texas has had brownouts consistently because they don't have grid, sub, you know, capacity in, in certain times. So we're finding the same kind of requirements. Uh, it started in Southern California. It likely will spread to more where to get a building permit, we have to agree to some portion of renewable power on, on the building itself. We're going through the same analysis now of should that be owned by a third party and they lease the roof? Should it be what we call community solar where it's owned by a third party but the power goes to uh, the local community, often affordable housing projects, things like that, community good? 
or should we actually invest in the system ourselves, own it, control it, and, and participate in the economics? We have all three options that we've done, and it's been a case-by-case -case basis <laughs> sort of decision. But I think we're actually trending towards the last one, where we take control, make an investment. It's not our core business, I agree with you, Ego. That's not, and we, and we struggle with that sometimes, of is that a good use of our capital? but we've been comfortable that we can generate a reasonable financial return that's accretive to the asset and that it's de minimis in the, in the big picture relative to the overall cost. And so it's okay, like any other amenity we might put on a building, right? So, so that part, we're, we're pursuing that currently. So Bodhi, that's, that's them putting that into, essentially you're getting a payback in terms of the rent, if you like, that, that you're, right. you're charging. We, we, sell, we sell the electricity, or at least a portion of it, to the tenant. <coughs> they pay us additional rent as opposed to paying us for the, for the electricity. It's just incorporated in their lease that they pay additional amount for that. Okay, good. This is the way. Yeah, we have, um, yeah. We, we have a similar model, and um, we like to use common sense yeah, yeah. in all of this. So <laughs> also towards like communities and towards tenants. So if you can produce uh, green energy locally, then you should make it available to the companies that are renting space uh, from you. So we as a, a developer and long-term owner of the buildings, we make the investments into the PV installations. And then there's two possibilities. If we get the permits, because that's the biggest challenge in many places, to sell the energy to tenants, we will do that. If that's not possible, then we simply rentalize it back to the tenants. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. In terms of energy um, um, right, resilience, it is very difficult to have a, a roof filled with solar panels, take it off grid and say, we guarantee you electricity. So you always yeah. need to connect it to the grid one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the biggest, w w what I would expect from the wider real estate community is that when we as owners make an investment into PV panels, um, I would like to see it also reflected into a, a different valuation of such a building by applying a different yield. Because what happens right now, for example, if we make the investments into the PV panels and we rentalize it back to the tenant and the valuer is not applying a different yield on the value of the building, then basically the tenant is paying completely and only for this, uh, for, for this feature. I would love to see the uh, real estate investment community to start valuing those buildings differently because then we don't have to charge such a high premium to tenants for having a building with uh, solar panels. So there's an element of education there and an element yeah. of, of bringing that through so that it does get reflected in evaluations. I was interested in what you were saying, Ingo, about that you were seeing a clear difference in terms of the values for, you know, that there's very much a brown discount now and, a, and that that's only, the, the, the market is going to bifurcate in a way that, that that's, and that's, that's a change over the last year, I would say. If you look at the uh, broker reports, no? prime yields, no? that are all green buildings. No? Anything is green. And um, this asset we have in, in Europe, we have an index. When is the asset stranded? No? It so, should be on 2050. No? Then you have a prime yield no? mm -hmm. that you get in the market. Mm -hmm. Everything else, you get a brown discount on it. No? And I'm pretty sure, Bert, and I think you agree on it, uh, if you have a green building, even on the uh, gross leasing area of the logistics space on the ground, you get a better headline rent than, than having a brown building or something like that. No? You get even f for, for the en environmental stuff you have in the building, you get a better headline rent because it's accepted no? that you pay more as a tenant for it, as an occupier. No? So it's a win-win situation for everybody. No? Yes. You, let me just borrow that and I'll, it's my small bit of exercise for the day. <laughs> Hi, I'm Scooter Coppens from DHL, uh, where uh, uh, as an end user, I do uh, have some kind of issue with uh, rentalizing your investment, a CAPEX investment on PPA into to the tenant. Uh, it should be separated from the rent because your CAPEX investment could be, uh, should be uh, charged over a certain period of time uh, when, when the, the whole investment is depreciated. Uh, and if you rentalize it to the tenant, and certainly in Europe we have indexations, then we pay double up. So that's, that's actually, from an end user purpose perspective, uh, some, some concern that you would rentalize it to, to tenants uh, and end users. No, that's, in, that's interesting, I think. Um, you're making... I, 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 uh, but that's a really interesting insight, if yeah. I can pick up on that, because if you're not going to pay a higher rent, 
But we as a developer will invest money into developing a building with solar panels. How can we get the same returns? It's well, in the valuation of the building. It should yeah, be but I'm saying that the valuer, so that's the my point. The valuers are, are way behind where we are standing exactly. now. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's the major is, problem. Is your concern more that you might be being paid double yeah. But in fact, in this model, as, as I would understand it, that you're but essentially getting your energy for free because it's being generated by the building. So it Rick appears Richard. in a different way. Big Richard, Sorry. what <laughs> he is saying is, is, is very interesting. You should have a, a power purchase agreement eh, uh, separately from the rent, which, uh, which makes us pay for the costs, of course. Eh? And That's tenant, the model we prefer, tenant, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And tenant will Thank never you. pay more for the electricity then he will pay by his utility provider. And so therefore there is a sweet spot, but the sweet spot can only be the right one. It should be cheaper than his mm -hmm. utility price, much cheaper, why, why not for free? But yeah. if, if the uh, owner of the building gets the right, uh, 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 what you said? Yeah, exactly, value of the, the building. The value yeah. of why the why building should we sell the energy for free if we don't get a higher value? For the loading docks, the, 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 and the location will make the, 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 uh, the box much more valuable, but why not the PV? Good, thank you for that. I think, oh. it's, I th I think it's an interesting <laughs> topic. And if you're yes. paying less for your electricity, and yes. therefore that's somehow showing in the rent and reflected what? in the values, then it really would be a win-win for everybody, I, I, I yeah. guess. Right. Simple yes. solution. Yes. Keep it simple. <laughs> yes. uh, here in the markets, for example, in Benelux or Germany or in France or in UK, they are that tight from the land banking perspective. And we have really the DNA from Swiss Life Asset Managers uh, that we would like to have a green building and green tenants as well. No? Mm -hmm. So, oversubscription of four or five times if you go on, spe on speculative uh, development. It needs to be a win-win situation for everybody, no? Um, I, no. I wanted to, do, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, we, we've all been uh, benefiting from a really strong market the last year or so, notwithstanding, right? But the logistics industry has been has been really strong. So even bad buildings have been getting leased, right? It'll be interesting to see should the market soften, when the market softens. That's when I think you'll really see the better quality buildings rise to the top. And, and green being a part of that feature, right? So I think the, the strong market has sort of diffused the message a little bit lately. I think um, from capital market perspective, what's the, um, there's really to be seen that the available capital at the moment is for that, no? yeah. from brown to green, because mm -hmm. higher interest, no? 10 up to 15% RR no? to get a brown building, to get it green, no? you need to do some capex, that capital is available, definitely. You know, occupancy rate is in, in your markets in, in LA or New Jersey is at 0%, so it's right. the same in Europe. Europe. Yeah. So it's, it's a great <laughs> market to yeah. dive in. Um, and I want to just, just pick on one point as well. I mean, we this year we've had social impact, especially appearing a great deal more in a number of the conversations that we've been having, social value, those kinds of things. Uh, is that something that your clients are asking you to build in? Is that something that you're thinking about when you're looking at designing and, uh, and, uh, and I guess, advising clients around this area? It's definitely something that is becoming more and more a requirement um, we're now doing a lot of analysis for clients going back to existing assets and existing developments to understand the social value that they've created so they're starting from a baseline to see what is a typical development bringing into the community so we've now got models and tools to assess social value and give it a financial um, kind of value and um, we, we, we are building that into the new developments and try to understand what is the best way to bring in social value depending on the location. Obviously, location is quite important um, and uh, the usage of the building is also yeah. important. There is there's a tricky situation with automation at the moment where um, it, it can create issues locally because the main benefit, obviously, of having logistics and industrial is bringing in all these people and the labor and, and helping the local um, community. Um, so it is a big topic. I would say the, the, the E, the environmental and the sustainability side is still the priority. 
Um, social is probably um, secondary, but um, it's becoming more and more um, important. I would say, especially after COVID, well-being and social value are at the front of um, everything we I do. Think, yeah. I think it's very difficult to do the S part in, an, in, an, in a warehouse. Maybe floor heating will make it more social or in, in, in a garden, but I don't know how you... Huh? <laughs> There are ways. There are a lot of there, there are a lot of facilities you can provide, especially in big developments and parks, where exactly. um, a lot of uh, different tenants and Life. different occupiers can really come yeah. together to hubs and create yeah. a bit of a community. Also, to, to my mind, uh, social is very important no? because you have only a limited working force here in Europe, and you need to attract people to work in your building. No? I think uh, yours, you and the Netherlands are the front runner with your building design. No? So it looks, to be honest, much more beautiful than in Germany. No? You have a nice entrance, no? um, exactly design, no? et cetera. Uh, no? It's quite costly, expensive. No? If you look at um, offices no? For the, from the developer perspective, you may, it costs about 1,000, 1,200 euros no? on a standard uh, logistic box. No? Yeah. If you guys here in the Netherlands, it's about 2,000 something. No? But it makes it really attractive for somebody who's going into the building and to work on a daily basis there. No? Yeah, but I, but well, I agree with Anna, uh, what she says that uh, when you're developing parks, owning parks, then you can do so much more. So yeah. our S is super important. So we focus on uh, well-being and health uh, and embedding our parks into local communities. Mm -hmm. We don't put fences around the buildings anymore. We open them up to, co to communities, lots of green areas. We are investing in clubhouses as our own concept. So invest a few million euros to have a central, it's sort of a townhouse in the center of a park mm -hmm. um, where we have uh, a restaurant, doctor's office, grocery shop, um, our own office as well, outdoor sports facilities. It costs a few million euros, but tenants are willing to pay a premium on the rent just for being in an attractive location so it's easier for them to attract people, retain yeah. people. Yes. It's a no brainer. Exactly, yeah. because yeah. they need also their, their, their employees and they are, can only attract employees now when you are in a in a healthy situation, yeah. um, uh, we've only got five minutes left. But I just wanted to pick up. We've talked quite a bit about um, new development and what we can do with new development. But obviously, a lot of the assets are standing assets. Um, so, is that something? If we're beginning to get a brown discount on it, where there's going to be specialist kind of people coming in in order to buy those and bring them up to standard, or is it something that? the owner is going to be doing on themselves rather than selling it off and, and creating a problem for somebody else. Um, so how do we deal with, with those? Is that the next thing we've got to think about? Well, yes, it's, it's probably a thing we need to think about now. It's, uh, it's happening. 80% um, of the buildings that will be here in 2050, they're already uh, built um, and they're not built as green buildings or sustainable buildings. Um, in Europe, it's interesting that only 0.2% of the buildings are decarbonized every year, which is a very slow uh, progress, so it has to happen quickly. Um, we are working with a number of um, um, asset um, owners who are looking at uh, creating strategies for their portfolios. It takes time. Uh, because data is not available. There is a lot of theoretical studies done, but the reality is to get the decarbonization uh, progressed and implemented, you need real data, meter data, um, and also you need to really go to the buildings and understand how the buildings are used. So it is a big exercise and uh, we haven't got long to, um, <laughs> to progress with it, so it's got to, to start now. It is costly. I mean, that, that's the one issue that uh, I find a lot of our clients are faced with. We'll, we'll do all this amazing analysis and models and we'll come up with the results and then we will cost them. And um, it's not just the, the PVs or the, um, you know, the, the renewables. It's how do we improve the fabric? How do we improve the buildings? And that's where most of the cost um, is coming in. So. Yes, there's a lot of private investment required. And, and just, just quickly, Anna, the, both, you know, um, I think it was you, Bert, mentioned that the, you know, a lot of it is uh, concrete and steel. Mm -hmm. So are we now beginning to see different types of materials being used 
that are much less of a, a you know, much less of a footprint, if you like. You're talking about new developments now. <laughs> yeah. Um, we we'll still have got the materials we have um, on the logistics, I would say, in industrial. So still in concrete, they're here to stay. Um, there is more recycled materials in them, so there's definitely improvement. Um, but I think we can be a bit more passionate about existing buildings because the embodied carbon is already there. It's a huge benefit. So trying to improve them, it takes a little bit more embodied, but uh, obviously a lot more effort. So there is, a, there is a, a balance we need to find there. But yeah, definitely, I feel that uh, existing buildings will be the new big thing that people will invest more on. I think um, Anna absolutely right. No? Um, there are lots of things to do, with, but it's a great business no? uh, for everybody. And um, if you look at, for example, in your business, you use the solar panels. Um, we have 400 million uh, square meters of uh, uh, roof space here in Europe. No? Only 10 percent is a solar panel on mm. it. No? So we have 90 percent uh, to grow for it. No? And it's easy, quick wins no, that we. And how uh, about many of the roofs? This is a good, this interesting one. So we have a, um, many of the roofs cannot bear today's solar panels. So what yeah. are we going to do with that then? Yeah. Uh, that then it's going to become yeah, plastic. But, but yeah, okay, but, but technology <laughs> will evolve. But yeah, but you, <laughs> you need some structural yes. engineers, yes. don't you? <laughs> but it's costly, as you say. <laughs> right. Yeah, so. Yes. Um, when, I, when I was head of operations uh, for Brookfield, when we were a bit ghostly, uh, ghostly, uh, with Brookfield, um, there was one term. Um, to make it solar panel ready, no? Yes. It's quite, uh, it's not uh, that big uh, money to spend, no? It's easy when you, the building is not ready yet, so yeah, right. less. Even then you can do yeah. it. No, if you want it, you can yeah. do it. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's costly. Not so, it's not so costly. <laughs> it is costly, absolutely. We've only got two no. minutes to go. Yeah. So I'm just going to ask a final it's question, costly. which is looking forward. No. What it's are the next the steps? Of the wind. What, what are the next steps we need to take? So, I guess from your own points of view, what are the next steps to take in terms of making it more sustainable for investment and development? Who wants to kick off? <laughs> Keep it simple. Just Keep it simple. Absolutely simple. See the triangle between ESG, the, the occupier, and the building owner, because you have to do it together. And please the valuation of the building should be done differently when it's net zero of energy performance than without. Okay, anybody else? I was... Oh, go, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say establish the, the right baseline in terms of a specification so we're not allowed to be designing or even tendering <coughs> buildings that are not sustainable. We need to get this sorted. Um, the other quite important part of uh, the equation is really the numbers and the data. And I feel like having the right data and, um, and really um, investing on smart buildings um, is definitely the, the right way forward to be able to prove that what we are doing is the right thing. I would say one of the challenges we have right now is, is sort of competing priorities and competing initiatives. And you've got lots of people pushing lots of different directions and they generally are going the same way, but it's not, but sometimes you end up fighting a little small fights. So I just, I don't know what the solution is really, but I would love to see a more uniform, globally, within states in the US, all that, like just a more uniform approach to what our goal is. I think the fact that we're starting to talk more about net neutrality and zero carbon is a right benchmark as opposed to how many certifications do you have or that kind of thing, right? So I think that's a step in the right direction, but there's still a lot of competing programs and things that we spend a lot of time with paperwork, checking boxes that aren't necessarily making the buildings greener, so. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah a big focus on net zero buildings and um, to start valuing them differently uh, so that it also, so that then the real estate investment community will also contribute to make a, making these investments possible. Yeah. yeah, this, yeah. Uh, to my mind, uh, to my mind uh, the capital market had already recognized it. If you would like have really uh, great prices for your buildings, you need to be green. And um, what I see in the market at the moment, there are a lot of talks. I haven't read that much um, ESG studies and reports. 
But I think coming from the great theory, no, you need to know to deliver. No? You need to really to have that in the mindset, in your, co uh, in your co communication concept, going to the municipality, getting the, the barrels quite high, and then you achieve it with the tenants and occupiers that you have a um, carbon-free strategy with the building. You're helping your customers in that respect. No? Great, really interesting discussion. Um, thanks, thanks to everybody for being here as well. Interesting questions, and I think that was great to get some of the perspectives there from the occupier side coming in. Um, thank you to everybody. Thank you also to everybody who's watching this on demand as part of the program at Expo Real. Um, and the joy is that we are live, so we can all give one another some applause for being here. Um, we have next got the investors' lunch looking at the living sector. Um, so that, that's going to be an interesting focus. Um, and then we've obviously got other, other topics coming up uh, around this sustainability and social impact side. So if any of those are interesting, do let me know. In the meantime, thanks very much, everybody. And if you could join yourselves in thanking yourselves and the speakers, that would be great. Thanks very much, everybody.